Hey everybody, it's Charles from HumbleMechanic.com today taking your questions on battery relocates, Toregs that will not start O2 spacers and more, and for real this time, this is episode 228 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. <laughs> Remember, in order to get a question on a show like this, email me, Charles, at HumbleMechanic.com and put question for Charles in the subject. Ask your question right at the top of the email, then give me the details of your question. Also, if you don't see your question on a show like this, be sure to check out the Quick Videos playlist on YouTube. In addition to video, there's an audio-only version of these shows you can get on iTunes, Stitcher, Google, or at HumbleMechanic.com. All right, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals in a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, and even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. And real quick, I want to remind you, if you like the show and want to throw some support, but more importantly, get discounts to places like Black Forest, Eastwood, MT Knives, Coming Soon, USP Motorsports, and more, check out the crew membership program. Awesome way to score some discounts on stuff you're buying anyway. Link down in the description. All right, wrapped up. Hit the questions. First one up is from Charles. Can you offer some advice about relocating the battery in a Mark I cabbie? Thanks, Charles. Uh, great name, Charles. So yeah, this is actually way simple, uh, and I think a lot of people do make it out much harder to be. On my VR6 Mark I, I moved the battery back to the trunk. A couple of really important things that I did that I think that you should do too. One, make sure the battery is properly secured. I bought this really cool cage and bolted it into the back rail that held the battery. You don't want that battery sliding around or bouncing around anywhere. Not only can that lead to a loose connection problem, but can cause other damage. You don't want it to break and leak battery acid or all that other nasty stuff that's in a battery all over inside of your car. Also, depending on how much balancing is a concern, you may want to either put it on the right side or maybe a little bit further back. That really depends on how serious you are about maybe racing or weight distribution in the car. If you're gonna get your car corner balanced, you can kind of move it around and see what the best place is. In the back, in the middle, might make the most sense from a balancing standpoint, but it may not make sense from a usability standpoint. And don't forget, if you have a spare tire, you're still gonna to need to be able to get the spare tire out. When it comes to wiring, it's really not that hard. And think of it a lot like you would wire up an amplifier, right? We have a ground, so make sure we remove some paint and have a good solid chassis ground. It's not a terrible idea to run a second ground up to the engine compartment, so you can ground the engine up there. A lot of times the engine ground comes from the battery, so there may not be a chassis point to hook to the engine to provide it the ground. Not a bad idea to run a second one. On the power side, you're going to want to put either a fuse, uh, you know, within a foot or so of the battery, or what I did is I put a circuit breaker in there, which I thought was a better way to do it. That way you don't have to replace a fuse if something weird happens. In addition to that, it provides you a battery cutoff, so you can just flip the circuit breaker off and you don't have to worry about disconnecting the battery. You can do it really nicely on like a board or something so that it's easy to get to or up underneath. That, uh, that shelf that the cabbie has. So a ton of options on placement, but it's really not that hard. If I were gonna do it again on the cabbie, I would do a ground right near the battery within a foot or so to the chassis. I would run another ground up to the engine compartment, and I'd probably tee off on that ground to provide a ground up underneath the stuff for the dash. That way I had three rock solid ground connections. I think I used four gauge wire on that car. Same thing on the power side, I ran a four gauge wire from the battery to a circuit breaker and then circuit breaker up front. I'm pretty sure I ran that directly to the starter and then there was actually a pin on the starter that sent power to the rest of the vehicle. Also, you can get splitters if you, let's say, wanna reduce the size of your, your wiring. So maybe you wanna go from four gauge to 10 gauge to ground the things underneath the dashboard, or you need a 10 gauge to run to something else, or even another four gauge maybe to go to the alternator or something like that. There's a lot of options that you can do, but the wiring itself of it is actually really simple. The installation of it is really simple. I recommend drawing it out, like getting a piece of paper and drawing out your wiring diagram. This will help you maybe prevent any weirdness uh, beforehand in the planning stage. 
And then, you know, you may have to make some adjustments as you go, but the important thing is make sure you ground everything properly and make sure you install a fuse, or again, I like the circuit breaker really close to the battery within maybe eight to 10, 12 inches of that battery. And that will uh, prevent any type, well, I won't say prevent, but that should reduce the likelihood of a catastrophic thermal event just in case something weird happens. And just, you know, make sure you have power at all the places that would connect to the battery normally. It's pretty straightforward, and that's what I did on the cabbie, and it worked just fine. I'll try and find some of that stuff that I used, or whatever the new version of that is, and link it down in the description for you. All right, next up from Sean. I actually got this question, weirdly, from a lot of people with a similar problem. So it says, hey Charles, thanks for YouTube channel and sharing your tremendous knowledge. I've noticed something with my 17 VR6 Torag that has me worried about premature engine damage. When I turn it on after it's been sitting overnight, it cranks five or six times before starting. If I drive it around town or run to the store, it starts up on the first crank, but if it's sitting for more than two to four hours, it takes five to six. The dealer tested and showed no codes and correct fuel pressure readings on the upper and lower fuel pressure regulators. Should I tear out the back seat and install one of these little check valves on the top fuel pump? What do you think the issue is? Faulty pump, check valve, by the way, where's your shop located? Currently, I don't have a shop, Sean, but great question. So Sean wants to know if you should install a little check valve. I probably wouldn't um, because I, I, well, one, it's a 17 and it's still under warranty. And you really run the risk when you install something like that. If a technician sees it, the first thing they're gonna do is say, hey, we gotta get rid of this component before we can move forward. And getting rid of that component may be leading to replacing a fuel line, which could be expensive. So let's not go there yet. Again, Sean, what's weird is I've got this question from maybe three or four other people, and I really don't have the answer for you. This is something I never ran into on a Torag, period, unless there was a very significant problem, like we could prove it with fuel pressure. So let's backtrack a little, and let's pretend that this car came into the shop what would be my diagnostic approach to it? First, I would pull faults and check because, well, why not? You have this potential for a ton of information to extract from the car. Let's pull the faults and let's see what it's seeing. If I found no faults, the next thing I would do is try and figure out why. Is this not starting because it's not getting fuel? Or is it not starting because of spark or crank signal? or because it's not seeing the key normally, it won't crank if it doesn't see the key. So I'm gonna eliminate that one right away. Next, it's gonna be a lot easier to test fuel than it is gonna be to test spark. So I'm gonna do probably what the dealership did, hook up my fuel gauges and see what I'm getting. The key that I'm looking for here though is not fuel pressure while it's running. It's not fuel pressure at that hot start. It's what is the bleed down of fuel pressure after a couple of hours. Am I going from five bar, say, and this is just a, I don't know the spec, this is just what I'm thinking. If I'm going from five bar on first key cycle when it's warm, and maybe that all the way bleeds down to zero after a couple of hours, well, yeah, maybe, maybe that's the reason why it's taking a couple extra cranks. The other thing I'm looking at is door signal. What's happening when I'm opening the door, the driver's side door? That fuel pump should prime. Maybe the pump's not priming, and you can actually look at that yourself, let it sit for a couple of hours, and go back to near where you fill it with fuel, and listen and have someone else open the door, and you should hear the pumps come on. Or you can leave the windows down and stick your head in the car. There's a number of different ways to do it. Leave the door open and just latch it is another way. And see if that pump primes when you open the door. To me, that sounds more like what the problem is than losing fuel pressure is that the pump might not just be priming. But because I've gotten this from a couple of people, it's really strange to me that nobody's found anything or honestly what I'm like, my gut kind of says is this may just be a characteristic of the vehicle. We can debate for a millennia whether it should be a characteristic or not. That's not really the point that I'm trying to make here. The point is, is that may just be normal on this car and that's just what happens. So it's a 17, man. You know, I, I worry about customers going in and poking and prodding and actually disassembling things on cars that new because if you take it in for a warranty repair, odds are they're gonna tell you, hey, before we do anything, we need to get rid of this 
aftermarket component. Or, hey, look, someone's been in there poking around. Perhaps that's the reason why it's doing it. And to be fair, as a technician, we don't know. And oftentimes, we don't get the whole story from the customer. So it's not an unreasonable expectation to have the car put back to stock to do the proper testing. Remember, all of the specs that dealerships have are based on stock vehicles, not modified vehicles, not vehicles with a check valve installed. So that's just something to think about. I know there's dealers that get way ridiculous with it too, the kind of the other way, but I'm telling you that's what's gonna happen. So I would recommend taking it, getting it there when you can leave it overnight maybe, or extend it throughout the day, like drop it off first thing and don't plan on picking it up till the morning. The other bad part from a technician standpoint is that I only get two, maybe three cracks at doing any kind of testing per day because most of the time that it's there, the car's just sitting. So that kind of stinks from a technician standpoint, but dude, it's a brand new car. I would really recommend just take it back, tell them, hey, look, this is what happens. I can leave it for a day. You know, call me after the day and let me know what you find. Because you're bringing it back a second time, they're technically supposed to call VW and open up a case on the Torag. And if I'm getting this on multiple Torags, I'm guessing that maybe it's a bigger thing than just you, but uh, they need documentation of it too. And maybe, you know, I'm not saying there is, I'm not saying there's gonna be, believe me, this is just my opinion. This doesn't come from VW, but the more that they know about the failure, perhaps they can work towards a correction, be that hard parts, be that software or something, something else, maybe a coding change or something. I, I don't know if any of those are repairs. I've gotten in trouble for saying VW might come out with a software before, a software update before, so I'm not saying that, believe me, but uh, you know, who knows. But Sean, I'd really recommend don't go poking and prodding. You can do that diagnostic trick with checking to see if the pump primes, but keep bringing it back until they have a resolution for you uh, or, or can prove to you that, hey, this is just a characteristic of the car. All right, next one up is from Brian. I have an 07 Mark V Rabbit 2.5 with a five-speed manual. I've noticed an idle speed issue where occasionally the RPM won't drop back below 2,000 after coming from a stop. If I blip the throttle, the RPM spikes, then drops back down to 2K, then sometimes it'll either creep up or down. I tried to switch on an interior fan, the RPM drops to normal and will stay there. Recently, I've noticed an inconsistent power as I try to speed up and it feels like the engine flattens out. Could this be a gas pedal sensor or throttle body? If so, how can I check it out? And do I need to program the new part? Any insights are more than welcome. Brian, okay, um, I'm doubting that it's the sensor in the pedal, right? This car's drive-by wire, which means there's not a mechanical connection from the gas pedal to the throttle body. It is simply electronicals that control it. Uh, and I've seen maybe one bad gas pedal, maybe two throughout my career. It's a very uncommon failing part. Um, throttle body, on the other hand, is, is possible, but man, with a 2.5, I feel like if it was doing this, you probably should have a check engine light on. You're probably going to get an idle speed regulation fault. You're probably going to get a system lean fault because you probably have a vacuum leak. Now, taking the throttle body off and cleaning it, I like that. I like that a lot, and I've seen a number of these that do need to be cleaned. But the most common failure point on this car there's actually three, but the most common one is going to be the valve cover. So you can take the engine cover off and see if it's leaking. Um, that's, that's one really common place uh, for failure, and it can cause weird things like that. The other thing we want to look at, make sure the intake manifold bolts are tight. That can cause an intermittent system lean fault as well. You also potentially have an issue, uh, the possibility for an issue with the fuel pump or an issue with the fuel filter. If you've just put a fuel filter on it and then it started doing it, look at the fuel filter, make sure you got the right one. The two liter turbo and the two five have the same filter body, but the fuel pressure regulator inside is different. So they'll, they'll install fine, but it'll make both, if you put the wrong one on, it'll make the car run weird. I would do a quick visual inspection, pull that engine cover off and do a quick check on it. And you really, man, you want to get the faults checked. If you don't have the way to do that, you can pick up something for pretty cheap. OBD11 is a really good affordable scanner, especially if you have an Android phone. Uh, I prefer Vagcom. That's what I use. I use that one both with my phone and with, well, not this laptop, but with my laptop. And it, it to me is a better tool, but both of them will tell you what you need to know because you want to check faults 
and you want to check your fuel trims to see if maybe you do have a, a vacuum leak. You can take the throttle body off and clean it. It's best to reset it after you do that, but you don't have to eventually. It'll learn itself. If you put a new throttle body on, you don't have to reprogram it, but it is recommended. Besides, you're going to want to clear any faults out. In addition to faults, clear out the learned data of the ECM, and that will help. But my gut says, dude, you got a vacuum leak. Start with a visual first, and then if you can get the fault codes checked, even if the light's not on, still get them checked because you may have a pending code that'll point you in the right direction. All right, last one of the day comes from Dan, and Dan says, do you know if using spacers for the O2 sensors uh, has the potential to harm the engine or any parts of the catalytic converter in any way? And of course, Dan says this assumes that you're using it in a state that doesn't require emissions testing. The catalytic converter is just used up due to high mileage, and the only reason you're using the spacer is to remove or turn off the check engine light. So what Dan is talking about is to get rid of a PO420 code, which is a catalyst efficiency code. And I had mentioned a handful of other times that a way to do that is to all install a spacer for the oxygen sensor, the rear one, the post catalytic converter one. And what that does, if this is the oxygen, the stream, the airstream of the exhaust and the O2 sensors in it, this pulls it away so that less air passes through it. This actually doesn't really trick the ECM, but it kind of does into thinking that the catalyst is as efficient as it should be. And Dan, this is a really easy question. It should do no damage whatsoever. In fact, the only damage I've ever seen caused by one of those is someone not installing it properly or installing it in a way that stuck up too high and actually caused the exhaust to hit the bottom of the car, something like that. All you're looking to do again is just pull that O2 sensor out of the exhaust stream a little bit just enough to slow the sample rate down and provide that feedback to the ECM rather than the fast feedback that the rear O2 starts to see when the catalytic converter fails. Of course, this does assume again, like Dan said, that you're in a state or area that doesn't test for emissions because it will fail. In North Carolina, we have a visual check. Even if your check engine light isn't on and even if your readiness monitors are set, if I shine my flashlight up there and see an O2 spacer, well, technically that fails. Personally, you know, whether I think it's dumb or not doesn't matter, but once I take my little flashlight and shine it up there, then, uh, then it's an immediate failure because the catalyst has to appear to be working properly. And if you've installed something aftermarket like that, then uh, to, to them, right, to them, the them, that would signal that it is not working properly. So, Dan, I've never seen anybody mess up uh, their catalytic converter, which even if they did, so what? Because you're installing it because either you don't have a catalytic converter or you are a catalytic converter is old and worn out and you need a new one anyway. So I don't really ever see that to be an issue. There's other ways to trick the ECM into thinking the catalyst is as efficient as it should be. They make little, uh, little boxes that plug into the oxygen sensor to, uh, to emulate a good O2 sensor. So that's another way. Or simply an ECM tune oftentimes we'll take care of that too. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Questions, comments, you know what to do. You like the video, hit that thumbs up button. Don't forget to subscribe here on YouTube to your favorite podcasting platform if you like audio or over on the blog at humblemechanic.com. You follow me on all the normal social platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course on Snapchat. Guys, thanks so much for watching and I will see you or talk to you next time.